Welcome to the Imposter Syndrome Club. My name is Jessamy G. I'm joined by my beautiful co-host, Miss Alice Eady. Hey, Alice. Hi, Jess. Good to see you. And you. And today we are joined by a special guest, Jai Long. Welcome, Jai. Thanks for having me. It's really excited to be here. It's thank you as well for your um, incredible patience this morning. So we had a few... <laughs> Few oh, little hurdles. Oh, we're going to share this. Impossible are we? Pod HQ. <laughs> Just when we nearly got away with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just when we were nearly pretending we were actual pod professionals. Oh my god. Yeah, there's some um, roadworks happening on the street mm. outside this morning, so we had to like quickly do a little bit of a, a move and a shift around. And uh, yeah, so thank you for your. Uh, well, you know, it's patients. been interesting seeing the behind the scenes on how a real podcast operates. So it's <laughs> really amazing down here at the HQ. I love that reframe. Thank uh-huh. you. I love, um, Jai, your voice is like an amazing narration. Like it makes mm. me feel like that. I believe it. When you say it like that, I believe it. I hope so. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Well, excellent. We've got to one. that yeah. to that exact mm. point. Um, so, Jai, the way this podcast starts is that we ask our guests to read aloud their own bio. Okay. So would you indulge us, please? Okay. Well, let me preface this. Um, I don't actually write the copy on my website. I have a full time copywriter that sits there and does all this for me. She puts in these amazing words together to make me sound better than I am. So, just put that out there. Brilliant. <laughs> the second thing is, I obviously hate reading stuff about myself because. We all, I think we all hate that kind of stuff, but here we go. So my name is Jai Long. I'm a high level business coach for photographers and creative entrepreneurs. You've probably heard about me through my six figure business map online course on my wedding photography summit or my make your break chart topping podcast. When I first started out, I wish I had a mentor to guide me through the highs and lows and keep me accountable. Someone to show me the ropes and teach me what works and what doesn't to save me time, energy, money that gets wasted on trial and error. Beyond liberation of financial success, the one thing and the most I'm most proud of. Okay, here we go. I'm learning something new myself. <laughs> the one thing I'm most proud of is my amazing community that I've created of of like-minded community of photographers, creatives who are carving their own path, hundreds of whom, which actually it's actually thousands, thousands of whom have successfully <laughs> built their own six-figure business and beyond. It's powerfully rewarding to support my community to go through life-changing transformations overhauling their mindsets and stepping them into their empowered selves. Wow. So that's, this, uh, that's pro, isn't hey, it? That's hey, 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 hey. <laughs> so this is interesting. Did you change that to the first person to read it yourself or that's written in the first it's person? It's written in first person, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So yeah. it's written by someone else but in the first person. <laughs> uh-huh. mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah. I like that's it. the opposite. Usually it's written in the third person by, by the, the first person. person. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, I just say like it's it's so much easier just to, um. I mean, Mel, she's worked for me mm, like probably a year and a half now but she knows me deeply so she knows how I talk, um, the things that I actually say about myself I wouldn't say so she'll put it in there and mm-hmm. then um, I'm just – pretty lazy with that kind of stuff to be honest yeah no you know, that's I'm great i'm out there doing my thing i don't want to do that mate i'm all about outsourcing mm-hmm. as much as you can <laughs> all of the shit that you if you can if you can yeah um absolutely why not do it I why think. not do it yeah so there was a lot of stuff in there you've yeah. done a lot of things yeah, it's yeah, very impressive you're impressive i mean impressive there's actually person. way more stuff than that that's this is very i bet yeah condensed down little thing so you go, oh, I, I, I have so many places to start, but yeah. um, just to kind of observe as well, like you're, you're such a well-spoken person and I saw you speak first in front of a crowd about a month ago at Creative Mornings in Melbourne and it was incredibly compelling and part of it that really struck me and I, I, Jessamy as well, we spoke about it afterwards, was that you showed up on stage with absolutely no paper, with no notes, nothing, and you spoke... You spoke to a crowd the way you might speak to one person. Mm. It was it was very real and very intimate and not at all um, that kind of like TED talky vibe that I feel. I mean, not to talk shit on TED talks; they're amazing, but like there's such a particular way of presenting and storytelling that people have learned within this frame of public speaking, right? And that was not how you spoke. Um, <laughs> Oops. <laughs> no, and I, I, liked, I mean I that as I, I truly course, I mean that as the utmost. Uh, compliment so I guess is that something that you have always been comfortable with doing and just also noticing the difference it felt really different listening to you read your bio like it's not it it, it's not natural it's yeah it's not it doesn't seem you right so like can you just sort of 
Well, it's a funny story. It's a really funny story because I felt like I didn't really go to school. I didn't do much schooling. So I never really had to stand up in front of class. Uh, and the times I did, I was mortified. And the, one of the reasons being is because I couldn't really read and write. And I had to learn how to read and write in my late teens and then in my 20s. Uh, and then before that, I had to really kind of uh, mask the fact that I just wasn't educated like everybody else. And I did that through, um, well, the way that I talk, uh, things like that. I had to change my accent as well, the way that I talk, because yeah. I grew up low socioeconomic area. Um, there was a lot of swearing, a lot of slur language. And I think um, the way I realized really quickly, I actually went and spoke at this event um, in New York, I think. And I realized people can't understand me. So I, I need to speak clearly, softly, uh, direct and you know, not hyphen words and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's been a really long process to get to this point. I break all the rules all the time. I don't care. Uh, and I think for me, that's what makes me me and I'm really comfortable with myself. So when I do get up on stage and, um, and I talk, I know there's so many rules I'm supposed to be doing and so many things I'm supposed to be doing. And at the end of the day, when I look around at everybody, I'm like, man, everyone is fucking scared to be up on this stage. I'm scared of it. Mm. And so why am I going to pretend I'm anyone else? And, it, you know, so I stand there and I, and I present as if I just got up from the crowd and, and I'm, I'm speaking to you guys because we're all in here together. And I feel like for me, that's what I want to see in a presenter. What um. How do you think about like how much of this was conscious when you first started, like the first few times you were presenting, like, did you go into each engagement kind of quite, quite intentional around yeah. certain changes you were going to make or Always. did they evolve over it? And how do you think about that beforehand? It's really interesting, but the first thing I think about is how I make people feel like that's mm -hmm. the first thing. So if I'm standing on stage before I even get on stage, if I come up and I hug someone or I talk to someone like even afterwards or something, I'm like, how do I make them feel? And then from there, like failure for me, I mean, I can't fail because unless I give up, but failure for me would be, um, well, there is no failure. I mean, failure for me is not being my true self. Like that would be failure. But so like getting up there and if I can talk to everybody and just present the fact that I got up and did it, if everyone walked away and said that was horrible, I wouldn't care because I was like, yeah, but I took the courage to stand on stage. Like I got there and I did something today, you know. And is that something that you've learnt over time to be able to access that, that part of you that's like this is the value is in me getting up there and being mm. jai, not me getting up there and presenting a perfect talk? I think like I see myself as the underdog, the ultimate underdog. Like I'm like, there's no one that's going to help me. There's nothing out there. Like there's, I see myself so much of an underdog that I've got everything to prove and I've got nothing to lose. And so whenever um, like I get up and do anything, I'm like, well, the, my biggest asset is me being my, myself. And as soon as I try and be someone else, then I am an imposter. And it's mm -hmm. fucking hard to be someone else or try to live up to someone else. And you know, people all the time tell me how I can do things better. And I'm like, I know I can. I totally, there's so many things. I, there's a list of things that I could do so much better and it's endless. And I look at them all the time, but I'm here and I'm doing me and that's the best that I can do. And tomorrow I'm going to do better. That's a really interesting balance of things too, I think, right? Because you, it's holding two things at the same time. One being like, yes, the most important thing is your Giness and being you and being authentic to yourself but within that there will always be things that you can improve upon right oh, yeah. so like knowing the difference between what are the things that are worthwhile to spend time looking at improving and what are things that are potentially changing something that's actually just an inherent part of your character and part of your mm. value well you know like here's a random fact I see myself as an artist before I see myself as a business owner and I think that's why I'm a good business owner because mm. you need to be an artist to create an amazing business right and everyone sees it's the other way around and so the way that I look <laughs> At business, it's like I need to be really creative. I've got to be myself. I have to show up as myself. I've got to do all these things. Um, and it's not the other way. So being an artist is, mm. I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going with that. But like it's, I guess like, um, yeah, like tapping into understanding like why you're creating something, who you're creating it for and everything before the business comes into it. Mm. I'm so struck yeah there's there's so much to unpack there and it's such a it's interesting here you integrating two parts of an identity that people tend to keep as quite 
polar opposite, that the mm. idea of artist and business person is not, those cannot cohabit in the same person. Like you've got a very easeful way of, 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 and a light way of holding them both. But just to, to kind of loop back, because I need to, because selfishly, yeah. this is yeah, yeah. amazing what you said to me, was this idea of that for you, you're not an imposter unless you're pretending to be someone else. And I, that is such, I've, I mean, maybe that's, I don't know if that's like obvious to anyone else. That's not obvious to me. And it's something that I've, even in doing this podcast, so much of this discussion around what it means to be an imposter is whether you have the right to be in a certain room, whether you have the right to present as a certain, someone with a certain skill set. Mm. but you've really subtly, but very importantly reframed that. And it's like, your yeah, your job is to be you at which point in, the impostorship is being anything other than that. Like you're already, I love that. <laughs> it's fucking hard to try and be anything but yourself, isn't it? It just really is. It's exhausting. Yeah. yeah. And it's, but it's also so fucking wild to me that now at like almost 40, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, like this is literally something <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. just fucking landing <laughs> yeah. with me now. It's like, that feels like it Wait should a be second. a really <laughs> obvious mm. that's thing, I, but it's just not, or you I, don't realize you're doing it maybe. I think it's sometimes, sometimes, and maybe this can tie into your business coaching stuff with this idea of like coaching people, how much is advice and how much is getting people to realize it on their own. But with so many of these realizations, sometimes you have the aha moment and realize that it was, it's just you learning something in your bones that people have told you since you were four years old. Like mm. it'd be like, oh yeah, believe in myself. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> You've got to like earn it. At some point you, you go this whole full circle to kind of um, come back from it. But earlier you were speaking about uh, what sounds like a, like a really, really difficult childhood and upbringing and, and the confidence that you found to almost channel that into this, like you were saying, like this underdog who's got something to prove. So like, I'm fucking showing up and I'm doing the thing. How, like, was that, was that feisty fire that like the like little fighter, was that in there since you were a kid? Like, how was that? I think so. It's um, something that's been hard to deal with because it was not an asset when I was younger. Like I was very much, um, I was fiery and I thought my way is the right way. I had attitude. Um, yeah. So it, it took me a while to sort of harness the power and realize it's an, actually an asset. Like you need to have that unveiling like confidence in yourself where no matter where I go, I understand my abilities. And that's really important because a lot of people say fake it till you make it, but it's not true. It's not about faking it. It's like understanding you, how resourceful you are. Because if I come into a room like this and you said, Jai, you need a podcast, like let's get onto this. I'm like, well, I'm not very good at speaking, but I'm resourceful. I'm going to learn a few things, a couple little tips, and that's going to get me through into the next thing, you know? So, um, knowing the skill sets that you need to know, like, I mean, the way that all creativity, and the way that we will work, it's like a ladder. And if you want to move yourself up the ladder, right, we all do because it gives us purpose and purpose makes happiness. And then no matter if you're an artist or a business owner, whatever it is, and if you imagine a ladder, you have two sides and then you've got rungs on a ladder. So one side, right, is your belief system. You believe so fucking much that you're more than this. You can do more. You have so much power. And then on the other side is your success habits. And habits means the things that you do every single day. So maybe smoking cigarettes might not be a success habit. So maybe that's pulling you down from your higher self, whatever it is, right? But then the rungs are skills. So you can have the habits and then you show up every day, you do the thing every day, you make the bed every day, you do the thing, and then you believe yourself, I can do it, I can make it happen. But a lot of us, we don't have the skill set. So each rung is a new skill set. And when you finally learn a new skill set, you can move up a tiny bit. And it means you can also move down and you feel free because you can move around. Some people, they hit instant success because they believe in themselves and they've got those habits. They don't have the skills and then they get stuck on it because they can't move up or down. Uh, and then, you know, there's no foundations there. Or on the other side, you can have all the skills in the world. If you don't believe in yourself and you don't have the habits or if you don't have the habits, it doesn't matter if you believe in yourself and you've got the skills, you're just not going to get there. So mm. you need this triangle to be able to move yourself up. And so... I love to pull things where it's like, you know, a lot of times we just imagine like, oh, it's, I don't know how it all works, but then quantifying it so it's like easy to understand. It's like easy maths now. It's like one plus one plus one is going to equal your success. Yeah, and then it feels like an actual manageable mm. game plan almost, you know. And then there's can... a reason too. If someone says like believe in yourself, it's like, well, there's a reason for that because if, yeah. if you don't have the skills and all the other things, like it doesn't matter, right? 
And so if we're looking at those, uh, so habits and um, belief. belief, thank yep. you, it's been sort of mindset of belief as the two sort of sides of the ladder. But you also need to build those, right? Like that's, Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're almost the hardest. Like the, run, yeah. the skills won't even sit on anything unless you've got those two. Exactly. And skills, know? feel it feels like there are models available to do yeah. that. Like you the can easy go, bit. Yeah, do yeah. a short course or, mm-hmm. what, you know, like they're more easily identifiable. So how, like particularly around the belief stuff, because I imagine rather than, so like habits, again, like that's harder because you need to ingrain it, but also there are lots of like tools and things available that can help you kind of work that out. But the belief side is, it's less about building it and more about tapping into what's already there or something. It okay. might not be there. Yeah. Okay. You know, like it's, it's all your mindset and it takes a long time. Everyone's at a different, it's almost like everyone's at like a different work level, right? Mm. And so you can usually identify someone straight away by the way that they talk to you or they hold themselves or something on how much they even believe in themselves. Because if mm. you, someone walks in, they've got full confidence, they can like capture a whole room because it's like, man, they they believe in themselves. I want to know what's going on over there. And I'm, and I'm now I'm drawn to them like a magnet. Where like if you don't have that and you walk in the room and you're trying to bring people down, a lot of times something like that comes from insecurity. You do that because you're trying to pull away attention from yourself and put it onto someone else because you don't believe in yourself, right? And so even all those tiny little things, usually even when I work with someone, straight away in the first conversation, man, like to do a mentoring session with someone, two minutes I need to have a conversation with them and I can see where they're at, the block that they're having, and it's never skills. Like they always say skills, John, I need more marketing because, man, no clients are ever booking me because like I just, you know, my work's not good enough and it's not getting anywhere and the algorithm's changed and it's all broken and nothing works anymore. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, it's not the marketing skills you need actually. You know what I mean? Like you already know what marketing skills you need. Yeah. It's, it's so hard. Jingle, jingle. I just whacked my head on <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we've booby trapped this yeah. room ahead of time. <laughs> It's just really helpful having an image for it as well. Like to be able to see a thing. Like I find with my brain, like I cannot think a thing that I can't Mm. see. And the second there's a model for it. Everything that I do is for creatives. And the reason being is, and a lot of people don't realize this, it's because it needs, you need to use your imagination and you need to be able to visualize something. Like creatives visualize. They're fucking amazing at doing it. And if you talk to anyone that's um, logical, like they can't visualize anything. I'm like, this is what the room will look like. This is the color. The you know the window's gonna be over here. Can't imagine it, Joe. Mm. What do you mean? Can you draw a picture? What do you mean? Can't imagine it. Use your imagination. You know. So, creatives though, they have the superpower of being able to imagine their future or imagine what it'll be like to hold an exhibition. Imagine what it'll be like if I make that piece of art that I was talking about, or launching that podcast, or or making something. And because they have that imagination, it's really easy to go towards that. You know, it's not about outsourcing, it's insourcing, it's in your brain where it's really hard if you're you're logical to outsource that, you know, the vision of your world. (laughs) Impossible. Mm. So that's sort of coming back to the like, like the creativity is actually making the business part easier in a lot of ways where we're told that they're like separate and because you're good at that, you're not ever going to be good at that because you need to be the numbers guy, market yeah. guy or whatever. Creatives, man, yeah. like they can be the best in business. There is no reason why an artist has to struggle. They have all the skills that they need. Um, they have everything. The only thing they don't have is confidence because so many people told them that you can't make money from art. Yeah. You can't, you know, there's so many blocks mm-hmm. there. They get so many no's and they don't have, um, I guess, like the confidence in themselves or the belief in themselves that they can get past that because I got all the no's. But I just told those people to fuck off, you know, and like they yeah. tell me no. I'm like, well, who the fuck are you to tell me no? Like mm. you haven't done it. So don't tell me something because, mm. you know, when someone tells you people, I'm, I'm writing a book right now and people say, Jai, it's so hard to write a book. I'm like, you haven't written one. Like, do you know? Thanks. Like, Thanks for the yeah, no, uh, I mean, I was happy, feedback. No one reads books anymore. <laughs> what? I read them all the time, you know. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, you just got to pick and choose yeah. where you're getting that from because it affects your confidence. And also, and this is more of a side note, but I just think it's interesting. People measure the value of things in metrics that relate to their own life. And even just the comment, like people don't read books anymore is firstly just patently incorrect. But even that aside, it's like that views the only value of you writing a book as people reading it. And it's like, maybe that's not what's valuable for you. Maybe for you after how many years working Mm -hmm. in this space, it's it's the exercise of condensing that. I know. And the way that my brain thinks is when someone says like people don't read any books anymore, I'm like, 
the right people are reading my yeah. book. You know what I mean? Like yeah, people yes. are going to read my book. Yeah. You know, I don't know about your book. You haven't even written one. No yeah. one reads it, obviously. I, I people are going to read my book. I know? think that Trudy does just speak more to that person than of anything. Yeah, yeah, which I suppose is, is most feedback, right? Yeah. So, Jai, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Because I know you... Do you start as a wedding photographer or was that somewhere a bit further along? The... That's much further along, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's back it right up Yeah. and give us the start of the... Well, okay, so I finished school story. when I was like 15. Yeah. And I actually started a cafe. I wanted to really help my dad um, with a cafe. This is like, if, if I can digress here and tell a bit of a story. Please, yeah. absolutely. So th- I think this is a good story because it, it brings me back to a space um, and it also really shows like where business sort of starts. When I started, um, I've, I've, I finished my apprenticeship when I was 19, 20 years old. So I started really early and I was a full uh, qualified electrician. And then I said to my partner um, that I wanted to one day run a cafe because I think that'd be really fun. And at the time my dad was in rehab and he was also homeless and stuff. And there was just a lot going on there. And I was really trying to rack my brains. on like, how could I get my dad um, some purpose? And I was like, work gives him purpose. So for me, I was like, I need to get him a job, get him out of rehab. So I went around Yellow Pages and I was just cold calling, ringing, ringing, trying to get him a job. And I remember just like, you know, I was borrowing money, 50 cents. Actually, back then it was 20 cents for a phone call, like over and over and over. Um, And I couldn't get anything. And I was like, why? You know, I'm low socioeconomic. I don't understand how the world works. All I know is like, why is there all these gatekeepers that, why do they make the rules? That's what I thought. And so I was like, wait a second, the rule makers are the, are the employers. So I need to be an employer. I need to be a boss because if I'm a boss, then I can employ my dad, you know? And so that was the, literally the logic of my first business. So then I went into it. We found a space, uh, got all my friends together. We renovated, I sold my car, got all my savings, put everything into it. We renovated it for like six months. And then we had this big um, grand opening and stuff. And then unfortunately my dad passed away about a week before we actually opened the doors. So it was really hard. And then I didn't know business because I was a 19-year-old kid trying to run this giant cafe that could sit like 350 people and I had staff everywhere. And my logic and my brain, because I'm really creative, is just, okay, as long as a coffee only costs me like a dollar to make and I'm selling them for 350, then I can pay for everything, right? So the more coffees I sell, the more successful I'm going to be. And so that's how my brain worked. Unfortunately, there is a few more things in business that I just didn't realize. <laughs> And it took me 12 months until my partner was like, you have to close the doors. We're working 80 hours a week and you're just killing yourself. And I went and got another job and then I was putting money back in the till on the weekend and I work all weekend and then I'd get up and, you know, do it all over again. And it was, it was the hardest year of my life and also grieving and everything. Yeah. And then I remember like um, I closed the doors and a friend, I was living in the cafe at the time with my partner because we just couldn't afford rent or anything. And my friend um, gave me this old, broken up Tarago that he was going to take to the tip. And um, we took that and I remember I closed the doors. I had to let go of all the money, I had to let go of everything. And I just lost and I, and I had to go for bankruptcy. And then I drove out um, to the headland. I remember I was like, um, I woke up in the morning because we were sleeping in the back of the car. And I was watching the sunrise, the sunrise on the east coast of Australia. It's like up over the ocean. I was watching the sunrise and the windows cracked a little bit. The air's coming in. And I just remember like I had this feeling of like, fuck, man, like, no matter where I am in my life, this is um, the lowest point that I'll ever be and it's also my happiest point because I'm free and I've got everything in front of me and nothing behind me, you know. Mm. So for me it was like a, a really like one of these moments that just changed my life and then I probably sat in it for half an hour and then I just made a new plan of how was, was I going to dominate the world again. <laughs> and so I did that. <laughs> So for me, yeah, I think, um, and and then like I went back into electrical work. I went to the mines and I started an electrical company and then um, eventually I made a bunch of money and I realised money wasn't the thing that got me happiness and then I wanted to be a photographer. So I quit one day out of nowhere, didn't know how to use my camera or anything and I just told the world I was going to be a wedding photographer. Yeah. <laughs> that, um, there's so many questions I would like to ask out of that. Um it feels, I mean, so many people put off doing things because they have a fear of failing or a fear, fear of succeeding and totally. it feels like you don't really have either of those things, which is pretty fucking special. And to be able to recognise even at the time that, okay, this is the lowest point but also the most liberating, I feel like that's something that is often 
really easy to see in hindsight, but very hard to see mm. at the time while you're in it. Um, is there, do you think there is something in particular that allowed you to be able to see that as an opportunity or just your personality? I think my personality is like, um, I've always known that opportunities are in the hardest times. Like if anything gets hard, there's always opportunities. My brain's wide like that. That's why I can make money and do mm. things because you know, like history shows us that like more billionaires and millionaires are made during recessions, wars, like COVID, anything else. It's because if you are wide like that, you can win the game because you don't see it as failure or as anything hard. It's just like, oh, the, the landscape's changed slightly. And so what, where, like, where's the attention going? What, what can I do here? Like, what, what, how do I need to pivot? You know, instead of sort of like, um, I never think about yesterday. That's like one thing, you know? So I think a lot of the times people get hung up on this one project that they did that didn't work and they'll never try again or this one thing. And, or I heard a friend that did wrote the book and no one read books anymore. Like this one thing. Right. And for me, I'm like, well, I remember yesterday. I, actually, if you ask me right now what you do yesterday, I can't even remember because I'm so fixated on tomorrow. Like I, I'm obsessed with it. I'm thinking because today, everything I do today is is leading me to tomorrow is going to be a different outcome because of what I do today. And so I think about that. If I dwell in the past and if I think about these things, I'm bringing it to tomorrow and I'm already trying to let go of it. And so this podcast right now, I'm not doing it because of yesterday. I'm doing it because I know someone's going to listen to this when you release it in three weeks' time. I'm going to thank myself for taking the time to come over here and that I impacted somebody. It's something that I did back then, but mm. now it's working now in the future, you know. And so every decision is based around that. Mm. Well, it have to be so like presumably you're doing some reflection on yesterday in order to be able to grow for tomorrow though, right? I did. It, yeah. it, when I was 27 was the first time I ever opened up and talked about my dad passing away. Yeah. And now I can talk about it on a podcast. Yeah. Well. Or it was the first time I talked about it. I mean, there's still so many to stories I don't tell them. Because it's just too hard. Yeah. And but I've realized like it's me obsessing over my past has never got me forward. Mm. You know, so I've because I've realized that, but and also obsessing over my uh insecurities, the things that I can't do right, like all these things. Like there's so much I can't do right, you know, there's so much I don't know. And the more obsessed over those, I realize the more I obsess over mistakes, I realize it takes me away from my success because it's counterintuitive. You know, you see all those click headlines it's like avoid these three mistakes like if I you know the biggest mistakes listening to that because now I'm listening to someone else's yeah. mistakes yeah and it's like it gets you away from success so there's so many coaches that will teach the mistakes and failures and I'm like don't listen to them only listen to the people that will tell you the success reason being is you only have a certain amount of confidence certain amount of courage certain amount of bandwidth in your mind to be able to hold information now every day if you're listening to mistakes and things like that then you didn't listen to the path to success and we all make mistakes. It doesn't matter. So listen to the path, go towards the success, make those mistakes. That's going to happen. That's human, right? And so if we move that way, we can really easily move forward through any project or anything that we do in life. Who are you? This is, it's, it's so, <laughs> it's so wonderful hearing you speak this way. It is, I have to also confess, it is like alien to me. In a way that is. Oh yeah, it's it's alien to everyone. It's, 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 it's weird truly, in my brain. It's truly, honestly, weird. and I and I think it. I really find it so generous for you to share because, because I think it's like anything. It's a learnable skill, right? Yeah. But the first step is just kind of s seeing someone being able to live into that. Someone kind mm. of like modeling it and and how it looks in the world, um, and even hearing you kind of speak about any failures that you've had as these kind of things in the world that are separate from you like at no point at no point are you seeing them as like a diagnosis on yourself and I think that that's just hearing you speak it's it's not actually something I've thought of in these terms before but like that is my pattern like that's what I mm. tend to do is like the fuck up is proof of some kind of like internal lack or internal problem and like just hearing you be like no the failure is just like a thing that happened yesterday goodbye <laughs> well, you know what it's actually something interesting on this for creatives a lot of people don't know this but one of the reasons why creatives struggle with imposter syndrome and and with like creating anything putting it out into the world a long time ago hundreds of years ago a creative would come and they would ask the angels to help them they would ask god to help them to create a masterpiece and then whenever they created a masterpiece, they never said it was because of them. They said, yeah, I, I was, the gods helped me. Angels helped me. 
Oh, it's like a, a channel. Different, different force, yeah. right? And so with failures, it's the same thing. God wasn't on my side. Angels weren't on my side. You know, these things weren't on my side. And so we see it as something separate. Now, for some reason, as um, time has gone on, now we see ourselves as the person. So it's like, I'm not on my side. I, I failed or I'm succeeding or, or I did this or I didn't do this. And so we attach our ego to things as well. But if you go back and think about like everything is not you because you are creating something. So you've got to channel that. Or if I'm creating a business, I talk about it. It's like it's a ship. It's separate to me. It's a vessel. It gets me from where I am today to my unrealistic goals and then I'll sink the thing when I get there. It doesn't matter <laughs> because it's not my identity. I don't care. If my podcast dies tomorrow, I don't die. Like that was a project that I did. It's cool. It's gone, you know. And so I think when you separate yourself from the things that you're doing, it's so liberating because it's no longer, if you're having a bad day or if you are having low confidence or anything like that, it's, it shouldn't be your business's fault or like the, or affect the podcast because it's something separate. It's so interesting because it feels like your like very strong identity and giantness is something that comes out through like all of the different things that you do, right? And that's probably a lot of where so. your success comes <laughs> from. But then also the fact that you're saying, but my identity is actually very separate from my work and you're able to oh, keep yeah. some of that, even though it's so infused through all of the things that you do, you actually hold it precious and separate to the outputs or the work that you create. Yeah. I mean, you know, everything that I've always said, if you talk to all my employees, I never said like, I all got up on stage and talked at Creative Mornings. I always say we did. Like we made that happen. You wrote the email, you contacted someone, we all did this together. And so for me it's like it's collectively, I, I didn't start the cafe, we did because my friends all were there, my dad was there, you know, I had so much help. This Like it's hard to just walk around and say that I did all these things because it's not true. It's it's a collective thing and I think it's so empowering to bring everybody on board. And if you bring everybody on board on everything, um, it's also like people can celebrate the success with you and people can also help you through the failures. And I think that's really good. You know what's really interesting and I'm just remembering now is I've always used we when talking to clients about my work and I've spent 90% of my time as a sole trader. Totally. <laughs> so uh-huh. I don't, and yeah. I don't, it wasn't like a trying to hoodwink anyone and make it feel like I've got this big company that I don't have, but I think it probably came from a similar kind of place. It's like, well, there are just like there are so many more things involved. I don't feel like even though I was for Even the most part, you're there just hustling by yourself. Yeah. It, it felt like it didn't feel like an I. It always felt like a like a we. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. There's also maybe something in this, and this is a half formed thought, but I'm Ooh. just just <laughs> all saying in real like time. <laughs> but um, the difference between identity and personality, mm. where like potentially personality are the the kind of like outward manifestations of a thing, and in that way. Your work, you know, if you read your website or any kind of brand that you build around yourself, that's reflecting personality traits, like a certain tone, a certain look, a certain aesthetic, like all of that is in fact personality, which should hopefully be separate from identity. That identity is, as you say, I I love the metaphor of like riding the ship to the place and then fucking sinking it. Like the ship is not you. And I think a lot of us find it really hard to separate those two things. Like we think we're our personalities. Yeah, I absolutely agree on that. Did that? Yeah. <laughs> Did that work? Yeah. Well done. Yeah, really A plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when you were talking, Jai, about when you um dropped everything to go and be a wedding photographer yeah, yeah. and you said, so I started telling everyone I was a wedding photographer. Mm-hmm. I'm super interested in this because I'm a big believer in the power of language and like like start talking about it like it's real. Yeah, of course. Potentially even before it is. And, again, I don't mean in a, like, hoodwinking, lying way, but in order for you to, like, step into that new thing, I've found that that talking about it now saying, okay, I've made the decision to be a photographer. So rather than saying I'm trying to be, I'm learning to be, you can just say I am, (laughs) and even though you are learning at the start. I mean, that's one of the things, like, if you're doing a mentoring session with someone and they're like, oh, like, I'm, I'm trying to be a good business owner. Well, just be a fucking good business owner. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like there's not, step one is right there. So let's work on that. And then from there we can get some skills and other things, you know. Like, yeah. It's so true. And, it's, you know, it's not just like the language that we use, it's everything. And it's, as I've grown up in um, in my uh, journey on self-development, I've found so many new levels with this, right? So, for instance, when I was young, 
for some reason, I was taught that all rich people were evil. And I didn't know any rich people. And then as I grew up, like I started hanging out with some rich people. I had a boss that was super rich and he was the nicest person I ever met. Gave more to charity. He raised more. He like more generous than anyone else. Created more opportunities. And I was mind blown. I was like, man, okay. So that's just broken my limiting belief. Now, as I like continue to grow, um, like it's not just the language. It's like the circles that you're in or the clothes that you wear or how you groom yourself and all these things, right? And it changes everything because if you're grooming yourself and you look good and you look like a photographer, then you're probably going to, attract other photographers are going to have different conversations you're in a different circle you're a different cafe now maybe it's too expensive for you but you're still there you attract new people and I always used to think like man why do people drive ferraris or wear rolexes and then lately i've realized like the person that drives a ferrari is because they get new conversations like the person that stops them at the fuel pump says what did you do and he's like this is what i did it's an inspiring conversation opposed to oh, i'm in this beaten up thing because i should look poor even though i'm rich you know, and so it's no longer a good conversation. Or if you've got the Rolex and you're at the, if you're at the bar, it's not because you're showing off like, look how rich I am. Have a look around. And I've noticed this. There's so many masterminds and so many things. Like the person that's interested in that Rolex that understands it, they will attract the other people and then they'll start having a conversation. And it's, they're just attracting the right people. So the language that we use, we attract the right people. The way that we wear, the clothes that we wear, all the um, our identity, our personalities, like what we put out to the world and everything, we're just trying to attract those right people. And a lot of the times if you're kind of like a little bit, uh, if you're on a self-development path, you're trying to attract higher than yourself all the time. You know, it's scary, but you're trying to attract the bigger podcaster or the or the bigger artist, the big the person that did the, uh, the bigger concert or something because, fuck, that's scary. That's fun. You know, how do I get on that radar? You hear this all the time. Like yeah. there's this really famous um, story from 50 Cent and he said when he realised that he wanted to be a famous rapper, he wanted to do all these things, he went out and bought this really nice car and then he got his car, drove to the club that they wouldn't let him in and then he like parked right next to the guy that like let, allowed people in and then they looked at the car and they're like, well, you we obviously should be in here. And then they let him in and he was talking about how a lot of his success and the people that he met was all because, and a famous rapper that he met was all because when they seen him next to this car, they took him serious because he was serious about himself. If he invested in himself like this, they're like, well, this is someone I can have a conversation with. Mm. So I think about that a lot. Mm. That's a really interesting framing because I think it's so easy to assign that sort of stuff to ego or of like, course, yeah. you know, one-upmanship or, you know, my neighbour's got this car so I Keeping have to the get. the Joneses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, That's what I mean though. It's really hard like to go through those levels. And I mean, this is like money mindset stuff. So if you see someone judging them because of the car that they're driving or something, straight away it's like, man, you've got to work on your money mindset. There's like it's going to be a different conversation. The person that's got a car is just like, man, I, I got a fucking car here. I'm getting into new circles. I'm doing new things like, you know, or the way that I'm dressed and I'm presenting myself or whatever it is. So if you're on the low on the rung, you're going to think it's ego. You're going to think it's like, Oh, someone's showing off or something. Um, until you sort of get to that point. And trust me, I always think it because it's hard to imagine as you're moving up, you know, can you talk to us a little bit about money mindset? Oh, yes, because yeah, fuck, this has been a journey. I can talk about money. Me. I love money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same, but honestly, <laughs> like. <laughs> I love money. Well, we had this conversation on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, mm. um, exactly this, where I said sort of half jokingly, like, <laughs> I love money. But what I meant was like, it's also, it's taken me an incredible amount of time to be able to, to, be say, able to like, say that. That's it actually takes a so fine. Much time. Yeah. I mean, and not, um, not, um, oh my God, my brain's not working, but like wouldn't get like, you know, hurt people to get it or, you know, let any other really important elements of my life or, or values slip just in order to get money. But, but having money is, is good. And I think we're told as creative people that you should feel embarrassed about that, that just doing the creative work should be enough, that you should be grateful to be getting any money for doing something. Mm. If it also brings you joy, um, anyway, money, all I'm saying is I've been on a real fucking journey and I'd love for you to talk to us about it. Money, money is something I obsessed over for years. Um, one reason is because there was a lot of domestic violence when I was a kid and it all came down to money. Like whenever my dad ran out of money and there was no more drugs, then, you know, he would get violent and things like that. And I always figured like, man, like if we just had money, they would solve that problem. Now, I know now it wouldn't have solved that problem, but in that journey of self-discovery and money, man, it's blown my mind with so many things and now it's so easy for me to make money all the time. I can make so much money. And it, it sounds like maybe that sounds like I'm bragging and I am bragging. And it's just a skill set that I have because I learned the skill set. Now, a lot of people say like, you know, the rich make money. 
uh, or you need money to make money. That's not true. You need courage to make money. Like you can come from fucking nothing and make money. And if you've got money, if you won the lotto, it doesn't mean you're going to make money. You're probably going to lose it. And I've seen that happen over and over and over. So money mindset is a really ingrained thing in us to not believe in money. And the reason being is because it keeps us all employees. And so we always want to be right. We always learnt this thing that like money's evil, all this stuff. Um, But the people that obsess over money the most are the ones that don't have it the ones that work full-time jobs, the ones that are looking for it. And then the ones that tell me stop talking about money because they don't want to talk about it when it comes to an intellectual conversation about money because they're like, Jai, you're obsessed over money. I don't. I don't go to work. You do. You're obsessing over a thousand bucks a week and you give up 50 hours for that. You know, I don't do that. Um, so it's a different conversation. But um, I do think like for all of us as creatives, the most empowering thing you can do in your life is is understand economics and money and it's way easier than you been led to believe way easier the first time that I fully wanted to understand it's when I was an electrician I was making you know over a hundred thousand a year and I just moved to Melbourne and my boss was paying for my rent and um I was like why is everyone in here rich and I'm not even though I earn the same amount of money as they do and I just didn't understand because I wasn't holding the money or investing it or keeping it or multiplying it and so I learned how to hold and invest multiply give and when I learned all those things, um, it doesn't matter how much money that you actually make, like anyone can have a lot of money. And that's the thing that like blew my mind. It's freeing and liberating. And it's there for like people say like, the you know, um, the rich people don't pay tax, all this kind of stuff. It's not true. It's like the intelligent people that have the conversations don't pay tax. Like all these things like. We're so led to believe that it's not for us, so we label it as the rich people, the advantage, the privileged, all these things. Um, but really, like, when you take off that label, you will never be rich or you never be privileged or you never be um, have that status because you are identified yourself as not being one of those people. So the second that you identify yourself as, like, allowing money into your life, like, it changes everything. Could you... And I know that this is a this is a huge topic, and it's I'm sure part of the courses or oh, we can talk that about you this do. Stuff for hours, okay, yeah. amazing. <laughs> so, do you have a few kind of top tips that you would give creatives, kind of run of the mill, mid thirties, who've been kind of chipping away at a craft for mm-hmm. 10, 15 odd years, and who are living but who are not kind of making what would look like any kind of financial progress? Like, where? Yeah. Did you like, say ten tips? No, 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 oh. no, just, just any, oh, top, oh, uh, top tips. Oh, top tips. Um, we said 10, I was like, all right, well, get out pen, <laughs> I'm piece of you paper. Wait for hey. it. <laughs> also, can I just um, acknowledge how I framed that? Like such a broad question. Like I, I've mm-hmm. just basically described myself. Well, I'm, gonna give, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give being you a, completely I'm selfish. I'm going to give you a broad answer then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just really quickly, like some mindset stuff. I wanted to explain what money is. Money is energy. It's an exchange of energy. You don't have to make money. A lot of us say, I need to make money. Money is already made. And there's so much of it on the planet right now that every single person I think is around about could be a billionaire. That's how much money is out there. It's actually everywhere. If you're sitting in your room right now, you can look around at how many jobs it had to take, uh, how many hours people had to work to create all the things, all the resources. There's just abundance of money. It's actually crazy amounts, right? So that's the first thing. We've got to understand you don't have to make money. Money's already there. You just need to bring it into your world. It's energy and we exchange it for something that we believe or deem that has more value than the price. So that's the that's the super easy equation. So if I see something and I'm like, ooh, that's worth more than the money I've got in my account, I'm going to exchange it for that thing and then that thing's going to bring, bring me some happiness or I could use it to make some more money or do something. So that's the reason why I would give up money. If if that's not the exchange, then I would not give up the money. So if the painting's worth, I mean, if the painting's worth, not worth, priced at $10,000 and I just don't believe that's what, you know, I'd rather the $10,000 in my bank account, I won't exchange it, right? That's just simple math there. But what money is, money is energy and I want you to think about it like water. So if I am um, sitting there right now in a paddock, a cow paddock, and I have money coming and going all the time. So I have water. And so what I do is I get I get a lake, oh, like a little pond and I start storing my money in there. So I, I get all the money and I start uh, the water and I start storing it in this pond. Now, there's not much energy going in there. So there's no flow. There's no movement. And what happens is my pond, even though I'm saving in my savings account, it starts getting stagnant. It starts evaporating from water. So inflation comes. 
Uh, it starts going green. Nothing can live in it. There's no energy. No one wants to be around it. And after a while, unless I put some more water in there, it's going to run out. So that's what most of us have been taught to do. Save your money, save your money. And I don't know one person that's ever saved to riches. It's almost impossible. And even though they teach you that, there's literally almost no one in history that's ever saved themselves to riches. It just doesn't happen. Inflation takes all your money, right? And everything else. Now, what if money flows in and flows out so it's like a river? And so you've got a stream going through it instead of a pond. So instead of you trying to save it in the pond, you allow it to come and then you allow it to go. So you spend it as much as it comes because that's what money's for. It's literally to spend, you know. So your quality of life goes up as the more as you spend money and you create different opportunities and do whatever. And now all you need to learn is how can you have the bigger funnel of the river having more water coming in than, than what's going out? And then if you can work that out, then you'll become rich because that's the definition, right? So there's less going out, more coming in. And we can all do this right now. If you're making 50000 a year, literally, and then you decide not to save, um, and not to have high expenses, so it wasn't fifty thousand that you spent per year, and then at the end of the year you only spent thirty. You've got twenty thousand dollars now, and that twenty thousand you could invest in something, and you could easy probably five times it, ten times it if you wanted to. Like you could do something with it. Um, so if we start seeing that it's just exchange of energy, it also means it gives us the freedom to give up money because you need to spend it. If it's in the pond, it ain't fucking doing anything except evaporating, right? And so so many of us are like, oh, I don't want to invest in this. I don't want to do that. I can't afford. I can't afford. And it's like, man, are you sure you can't afford that? Because think about you holding that money, where it's disappearing, what could you do with it? So if we do that, I think about like um, for myself, it's like what can I invest in? I invest in talent, like I hire people. I invest in myself first always. Like that's the best investment I've ever made. I've got coaches. I spend, uh, I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on my own education, my courses, coaches. I obsess over it. And then people laugh at me. Joe, you're a coach. Why would you hire a coach? Well, it's because I'm obsessed to learn and I'm going somewhere, right? Like you, you need to be doing that. And then from there, I'll learn what to do with money. So if I can learn what to do with money, I'll read a book. And a book I recommend for all creatives is You're a Badass at Making Money. Really good book. Um, need to go and listen to that one. It's going to give you a whole new perspective. I'll start reading books. I'll listen to podcasts. I'll watch YouTube. I'll sign up to a course. Like I'll do whatever it, I have to to make that money uh, to multiply. Now, one reason being is um, think about this. Everyone says like, Okay, you got, you got to, to obsess over money, um, it takes a lot of time and energy and all these things. But I think working full time takes a lot of time and energy and all these things. So if I want to go out there and make $1,000 a week, I know I can by working 50 hours a week. I know I can do that. There's no problem. I mean, there's roadworks at the front. I could do that, you know, I could make that money. And so what I do is I start thinking about like, okay, so if a business is the vessel that's going to get me from where I am today to where I want to be, what kind of business do I want to build and how big is it going to be? How much can it push me through the ocean to those goals that I want? And so I think about money completely differently now because it's no longer just like me exchanging my time. I think about what vessel do I need that's going to help me get those goals? Does that make sense? So it's just a different way of thinking of money, even though money's just there. But um. It also gives you the freedom. I, I, man, I've been bankrupt. I've lost so much fucking money. Two years ago, I had like maybe $5 in my bank account. This right now, like I have millions. Like literally if I've gone up and down, up and down so many times and I give up money and I give money, I give money to charity, I raise money, I give it away, I do whatever I have to do, but I'm not attached to it. I don't care about it. And if it all ran out tomorrow, I don't care because I have this skill set, I've got the belief and I've got the habits. Those I will never lose and I'll continue to use those to keep going up that ladder regardless of money. So, so with thinking about money, like the boat, like the vessel, and again, I love that because that will affect like where you want to go will change the boat that you build. Yes. Like, do you need a massive cruise liner? Do you need something that can smash yes, through yes, ice? Yes. Do you need Not something? Not many people know that. <laughs> it's good that you picked up on that analogy. Like, yeah. Away, yeah. You know? And and I like something needs Can I give sales. you just a, a quick little Please. one on that one? It doesn't matter how hard you row on the boat if you're rowing on the wrong boat. Yeah. Okay. So, th so this is, this then kind of opens the next question is how do you think about where your ship is heading or your boat mm -hmm. or, or kind of, cause I would imagine it's really hard not to get, like if I had a boat, right? <laughs> Any boat, a tinny, a yacht, I would, I might get so caught up in being excited about the boat mm. that I forget that about the boat, the goal. yeah, yeah. And how do you, how do you manage having a really healthy and engaged way of thinking about money, but also knowing what it's for or keep or holding that in mind? 
Yeah, like, I mean, okay, so the boat, we, we all, there's two things that we're trying to do. We're trying to get away from something or we're trying to get towards something. So we're all motivated by two different things, right? So one could be motivated like, fuck that, I don't want to be poor anymore. I don't want to live on my friend's couch anymore. I don't want this, I don't want that. So then you're motivated to move somewhere. The other motivation is like, oh, my God, I want to be rich one day. I want to do something. I want to be, I don't want to work, for, you know, five days a week. Like, I want these things. And so we're motivated to pull ourselves somewhere. I mean, the main thing is we're motivated and we're taking action. If you're not motivated and there is no reason to get off the couch to get uncomfortable, you just won't move because no one does, right? If you're sitting there watching a movie and it's just good, like there's nothing going to happen. But if the TV goes in and the power goes out, you're going to move. So a lot of the times, a lot of people um, will take more action when something bad happens to them or they have a failure or have something else because they'll get to a point and they need to get to this point when they feel so uncomfortable and they're like, fuck this, man. It's more, it's more comfortable now to take action than it is to take inaction. I'm more disturbed about, you need to get more disturbed about taking inaction than taking action. And when you swift, switch that switch, it's game changer. Because all of a sudden you're starting to think no longer about the vessel. You're thinking, what's my unrealistic goal? And so my, I say unrealistic goals because I don't believe a goal should be just like a checklist. It needs to be so unrealistic that it makes you so scared that you wake up in the morning and then you're thinking about it. You're having a coffee and you're dwelling over it and you don't know the next step. So you're ringing someone to find out. You're asking someone, you're getting into a new room. Because if you simply, if you're an artist and you're painting and you're like, okay, so my goal is to sell $10,000 worth of art and paint two more pictures next year. It's just a fucking to-do list. It ain't inspiring anyone. But if your goal is to hold your own huge exhibition next year and have the whole place full of paintings, man, that's so scary. You better get to work and take action. Also, you better tell all your friends about it because that's fucking exciting. You know, everyone's going to show up for you and help you. It's no longer now about the small boat or the small thing. It's about the destination. Let's go somewhere. Mm. And everyone always says it's about the journey, but it's not. It's about the destination. There's not many people that go like, man, I went to Paris. The flight there, fucking amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, main, the flight was just the best. Like not many people. They always say like, oh, I went to Paris. You know what the worst bit was? The fucking plane food on the way and the liner. And I had to go for x-rays and all this stuff. It's about the destination. Like get there. I actually did go to Paris a few months ago and I flew on a low-cost international <laughs> airline called Scoot and it, was exactly what it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no. It was, there you know was like funny, no though? TVs, so nothing. So many of us, we build businesses that are scoots. Literally. <laughs> I mean, scoot did. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, literally. But like we build this business where it's not fun to show up during the day. There's no money in it. There's no time. I'm overworked. I'm underpaid. I'm the boss. So I can't even ask for a raise. I don't even know what to do. So we run these businesses and then hopefully Scoot gets us to the destination. But, man, it's not even guaranteed, you know. <laughs> like it's, and then we listen to a podcast like this trying to get some hope because it's like, fuck, man, I am stuck mm. right now. No time, no money. Yeah. Yeah, money is... You- did you you go? Oh, I, I have, so I'm trying to give make sure that I. Alice is just getting her free consulting. Yeah, session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, this is a hundred percent selfish. I'm not even gonna. Way. I'm not even gonna pretend. That's the best way. I'm so on board. Um, I think what I wanted to ask is around what you mentioned earlier about seeking mentorship and how mm-hmm. you're a coach and you still seek other coaches, still seek other perspectives. Have there been any either? people or books or encounters with ideas that you've kind of with hindsight identified as turning points for you where like the light bulb went on or, or a shift yep. happened? There, there was one. There, there was a book and it's called Be Obsessed or Be Average. And I read that book in 2020. So it was pretty recent actually. And um, when I read that book, it's like for all creatives, I don't think many creatives are like, it's very down the line, like just tells you like stop being average, you know, get obsessed. But what I loved about it, because I read fucking every single book out there on business, I do. Um, it gave me the realisation and, and the courage to be obsessed because my whole life everyone told me just stop being so obsessed, stop being a workaholic, stop talking about this, stop being so crazy. Why the unrealistic you know, and so everyone tells me, be realistic, it's impossible, you can't, you shouldn't, you can't, you know, whatever it is. And so when I listened to that book, I realized there was other people out in the world that think like me. Because like you said before, not many people think like you, Jai, but I've known that my whole life. And I'm always like curious of like, fuck, why am I so weird, right? But that allowed me to be weird and because it was like you have to be that obsessive person because everyone that we talk about is obsessed. Anyone that does anything great is obsessed, Right. 
they obsess over their art. They obsess over, like, where's Anderson? Like, why do we talk about him? Everyone says, like, he's hard to work with. You know, the people quit on, on movie sets, but we watch it and there's a whole genre that's called Wes Anderson because he's obsessed over every detail. And I feel like those are the people I want to be. Like I don't want to be average. This is so interesting to me because I think there's so much <clears throat> talk and, and rightly so about balance. And... No, I don't believe in balance. I hate balance. <laughs> I was about to say I bet you have no balance. fucking interest in and balance whatsoever. There's right? the episode okay. title. <laughs> look, look, balance is people, it, it's like comes from this notion from when you work full time, from a, like balancing an average life with a shit job. And that's literally, and then our creatives yeah. are trying to bring this concept into like, oh, I've got to balance these things. And it's like, mm, you don't. You've got new rules now. You just haven't learned the new rules, right? So like balance you, you can't have balance. You have to be obsessed over everything. That's the thing. Like if, I talk about this a lot, but people say, Jai, you work so much. You're writing a book. You, you've got a fashion label. You um, do the podcast. You teach thousands of people. You do all these things. Like how have you got time for your wife? I'm like, I'm obsessed, man. Like I, I go home and I make sure that I weigh my phone. We've got an hour. I'm going to cook you a meal. You know, let's go do something. And I make sure, I'm like, that's the most important thing. I go into my business. I'm like, my employee is the most important thing in the world right now. Nothing else, not social media. I'm obsessed over it. I will go for a walk in the morning. I'm going for a walk. I'm taking my dog for a walk. I listen to a podcast. I'm obsessed over it. I listen to it. I'm growing. And so it's not balance. It's like what is the best version of myself all the time across the board because you can't get obsessed over business and let everything else fall away because your business will fall away. Like it will sink. You need to make sure that you are the best parent you can be, the best podcaster you can be. You've got to be the best business owner, the best artist, like all these things. And if you start showing up like that, man, the people that talk about balance, like that's out the door because they're trying to balance all this shit. You're not doing that anymore. You're only going life. I love that. I, and I think that the, I don't know if it's been twisted from its original intention or if this is the original intention, I'm not sure, but it's always struck me as really fucked up that we're, <laughs> that we're separating work and life. Yeah. And if you're working a 40-hour week, is that 40 hours where you're not living your life because we're talking about them That's as these much two it, separate yeah. things, you mm. know what I mean? So it shouldn't be a balance. It's more of a, I don't know, an integration or. Smash it together. Like yeah. smash it together. You yeah. know, like people say to me, Jai, you shouldn't do business with friends or family. You, like shouldn't mix pleasure and business. I'm like, what kind of shit business are you running, man? <laughs> I'm only doing business with friends. Yeah. You know, like, uh, like I want that. Like I want everything to be exactly the way that I, if I'm excited every single day about my business, it means it's a good thing. If I'm here doing this right now with you guys, podcast with friends, this is a good thing to me, you know. So I think a lot of these notions need to go out the window and we need to be more human and we need to realise that like business, pleasure, work, it all needs to work together. And if we can do that, you will have a very vital and happy life. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I've really tried to, um, with my clients now, the type of clients I want to work with. I'm like, I want them to be people. Like my aim is for every one of my clients to be my friend. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't mean not? in the sense that like they're existing friends, but if, I mean, okay, like we might not end up being, but I have like legit have quite a lot of clients who I've become really good friends with, but I at least want the potential for that to be there. Because if you get to work every day with your mates, sweet. Yeah. And why Life not, you know? Mm, Man, yeah. you know what I hate? I hate it when people tell me I'm working too hard, I go to go play golf. I'm like, fuck golf. <laughs> like, what a shit life, man. Like, <laughs> you know, I would rather be hustling, like doing another podcast, talking to another person, making a new opportunity because I produce and producers, like my happiness comes from producing, you know. So if I'm producing more, then the happier I am. If I'm playing golf, it takes me away from my purpose, which is producing. Isn't golf where all the rich guys hang out with each other though? Yeah, but I'm not at that level yet. Okay, okay, okay. I don't okay. understand it yeah, yet. Yeah. I don't understand it yet. But I'll get there. We'll come back to you in a year. Yeah, in a year. Yeah, yeah. I fully understand. Everyone needs to get onto golf. You're I'll fully right understand with this now. A club bag, yeah, yeah, yeah. a little golf bag. Um, I've got my gloves buggy. on while I'm sitting here. Like, you wouldn't understand, you guys. <laughs> You're going to make $10 million and then get golf going. Yeah, yeah. He's at golf level now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a whole new level. And then after that, I guess it's just like you have to fly to space. That's, yeah, that'll be just a new thing. Yeah, oh, you have to fly to space, build a rocket. Yeah, you must go. I don't know. Yeah, no one else understands. <laughs> we summer on Mars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quick vacay to Mars. <laughs> I'm still on Scoot Airlines. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> struggling. <laughs> Watching a movie on my phone. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Oh dear. Well, we're probably 
coming close to the end, which cutting me off. No, well, I mean, <laughs> I get how it. much time have you got? Jes- Jessamy's got it. Was the goal? I'll be I was honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's like, okay, I can't you relate. said the G word yeah, yeah, and yeah. you're fucking out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the first time that was mentioned on the podcast. <laughs> Weirdly, it's actually not the first time. Have we golf. spoken about golf before? Imagine if someone's like, talks about how much they love golf and then I just got on here and just ripped it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fucking idiot. Yeah. Um, multiple times golf has come really? up on this podcast, which is so strange. Are we yeah. obsessed with Golf? Should we be Maybe. having a golf podcast? <laughs> Are we a golf group now? We're a golf podcast with a slight uh, creative yeah, business yeah, yeah. inflection. Well, as we're golfing, we're going to draw pictures like oh, <laughs> of yeah. where the ball's going to land. Uh, uh, yeah, there's there is still so many. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like and and it's always the best feeling to know that there is so much more. I feel like it, mm. at every point in this conversation, there's like a node that we could have dived down into and found like a whole other totally. labyrinth of, of thinking. And yeah, I love the way you think. I also love the way you think in, in pictures and out loud and um, kind of to that point or the, you mentioned earlier with the ladder or with the, with the ship, these really strong metaphors that are kind of deceptively simple and they're able to contain an idea, but they're also really rich because it contains the top level of the idea, but it's unpackable and you can kind mm. of extrapolate There's and it's so really helpful to think. To and and I assume that this must come into the fact that you work as a business coach and you are you've you've learned and developed really powerful tools to get ideas from your head into other people's brains, right? Yep. So so can you talk a little bit about your role coaching and also how you think about sharing these ideas with other people because I would imagine and this is completely projecting but having having a very kind of <clears throat> excuse me very um general picture of your upbringing that there would be so much space within that like I think that could have engendered so much scarcity in your thinking right like you've worked so fucking hard to to kind of get yourself to where you are now but you're not drawing you're not building walls around that like you're kind of doing mm. the exact opposite so yeah could you just chat about how you think about that I love all this I love this question you know one thing I've always known is like um success as a resource is infinite and so many people think it's for me if someone else is a successful artist in my town then there's not enough success to go around and that blows my mind I'm like, what? Why is this such a <laughs> scarce resource, man? Like, <laughs> literally, you can keep producing and you can keep producing more success. And the success that you have now, it could be trumped by creating more success by doing more things. And I think that's amazing. We produce our own success, right? And it's in our minds. We can work out what success is to us. As a coach, it's really interesting because I'm not like formally trained in anything. Um, and I realize I only have one role, and that's really to listen, really. Um, I think so many coaches are trying to flex that they're smart and that they're popular on Instagram and all these things. And it's like, all oh, that's BS, man, because it's never about me as a coach. Like there's nothing about me as a coach. It's about me having empathy and understanding where someone's at and then having the epiphany of like, oh, I remember when I was there. Here's what I did. I think that's the most important. The other thing is like um, someone asked me not long ago, it's like, Jai, like um, – Obviously, you don't want to talk about your failures on here because um, some like potential clients might be listening and they don't want to work with someone that's failed. And I'm like, it's interesting that you say that because, I mean, that's your mindset and where you're at or whatever. But um, for me, it's like, man, I'm failing all the time. Like every day I fail. Every day. There's always shit going on, you know. Make all the mistakes all the time. They're like, well, how do you teach when there's mistakes? I'm like, well, it's my mistake and that's my thing. But everyone is doing something different. Not everyone's going to do what I'm doing. And we're all going to make mistakes because it's a really important part of learning and the journey and everything else. Um, But if I listen to someone, someone will tell me exactly what is the block. And then for me, what I do is I ask them, what do you need right now? Do you need comfort? Do you need hard love? Do you need someone to listen to? Do you need a strategy? Do you need skills? Do you need habits? Do you need the belief? Right. So I ask them the questions. So then I give them the space instead of me just going like, this is what you got to do. This is how you make a million bucks. Um, Because it just doesn't, it just falls on deaf ears. Like I can teach anyone right now how to do anything that I know, but it will fall on deaf ears until they're in the right space. So then they'll come to me, actually, Jai, to be honest, I just paid for a session because I wanted to uh, bounce these ideas off, off you and just to see how you react to them. Okay. Well, go ahead, talk. 
and I'll listen to the ideas. And that's the session because that's what they wanted, right? And then, of course, I can like drive it and I can work out, I always make notes, I can work out like what's, uh, what is what is the main thing that's holding them back. And there's always a huge main thing glaring in their face. And what I love about my job the most is blowing people's minds, which is really easy. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not because people are stupid, but we obsess over our own thing over and over and over. Yeah, we're, we're always obsessed over it. it. We're so close. Mm. And so when someone comes up like, Joe, I'm doing this thing, I'm like, well, have a look at it, look at it. And then... I'm like, man, because I'm not in your space, I'm not in your industry, I'm not anything. Like I'm looking at that problem that's right in front of you. Have you thought about this? And then they're like, oh, my God, I've never seen it. And then they'll call me up, Joe, I just made an extra 20 grand because of that one thing. I'm like, I know. You know, it doesn't take much. Like the old saying says, like if you were on Scoot going to um, France, right, if the flight path was out by 1%, you'd be roughly around 900 kilometers away from your destination. And so in our business, we always think it needs to be some fucking crazy strategy to get us so successful when it's not. It's the smallest little thing adjustment that is in your business right now that you've overlooked that will double your income. And we can do that over and over and over until you'll stop believing in yourself and you don't think it can ever work anymore, but it can just keep doing it, you know? So I think that's just like a really interesting way of like being a coach, which I think is very different to most people. And I think everyone's right. There's no one that's wrong. And I don't know what I'm doing. So that's, that's a thing. (laughs) But yeah, I think, I think um, as a career now, because I've been full time as a coach for one year now, um, I've got 22,000 clients. So that's pretty fucking amazing. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm, I'm really good at marketing. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, yeah, awesome. it's, yeah. It's, um, it's pretty humbling because I see result. I see the results. Like I see, you know, I work with someone, she's like, I'm a single mom, I'm struggling, all this kind of stuff. And then I see someone and she'll be like, I just, I'm out of debt and I just bought a car in cash. I know this is all monetary stuff and it shouldn't excite me that much, but for me to see someone actually, believe in themselves enough and to take that step like I I see it as life-changing and then it's nothing to do with me because I didn't know what I was doing I'm just on the thing listening you know so it's them and their success and their journey and I was just part of the process and I think that's really cool yeah incredible Jay well we should that's a nice a nice note nice to little wrap yeah. up. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for your incredible uh, generosity. I feel like we could um, do this for hours and hours and hours, but we probably can't afford we'll you for that long. I'm not getting paid. This is, <laughs> didn't even know. <laughs> oh, by that long, I mean at, at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, Joe, where can people find you? Easiest way is uh, go listen to my podcast called Make Your Break. If you go listen to my podcast, I'm always sharing tips and tricks and next year I'm going to do season two and it's going to be more geared towards like all niches of in creativity and I think it's going to dive in deeper. But, um, yeah, it's really fun. I share all the things. I share all the real low points and the real high points and behind the scenes so there's no secrets and I think that's the best place really. Awesome. Make your yeah. break. Make your break. Amazing. Jai, thank you so, so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. All right. See you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Imposter Syndrome Club. Please follow us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're feeling extra kind, rate and review. Or if you got any insights or value from this, share with a friend. You can also find us on Instagram at ImpostorPod or online at ImpostorSyndromeClub.com. 